Welcome everybody to our webinar series, Education for All Learners, Sustainable Approaches for COVID-19 Response in Jordan. I'd like to welcome you to our third webinar uh, on the topic of practical approaches to support all learners in their education at home. My name is uh, Stephanie Petras and I'm the head of GIZ Education Portfolio Jordan and the manager for the project Promoting Quality in Inclusive Education, PROMISE. Uh, the webinars are conducted together with our partners, the Ministry of Education and the Higher Council for the Rights of Persons with Disability. Welcome to my colleagues. Uh, before starting with our webinar today, I would like to give you our house rules and some logistics. So the language uh, of our webinar series is English and Arabic, and we provide simultaneous translation via our YouTube uh, stream. Uh, you find the link uh, shared in the, in the chat. Um, we do live captioning in English. You probably see it now happening while I'm talking. Uh, and uh, our lovely sign interpreter, Julia, uh, joined today again. Uh, thanks, Julia, and welcome um, to do the sign language. So the presentations today are only in, in either of the one languages. Most of the presentation are in English, uh, but I, I think the presentation of Dr. Musa will happen in Arabic. We will provide the translation when we upload um, the um, presentations later on. We like our participants to being active. I mean, that's uh, as much as possible. Uh, but because we have um, um, many participants joining us, uh, we decided to switch off audio and video function. But please make use at any time of our chat. Um, my colleagues, uh, David De Battista and Serene Altali, will uh, help to manage the chat. And also some of your questions or comments will be already reacted to. Uh, doing our webinar, but um, also David and Serene will help later on summing up and also bringing maybe some of the questions back to our um, speakers. Um, the sessions will be recorded uh, to make it available also later on to uh, to participants who want to listen up it uh, again, but also to maybe some of um, uh, yeah who couldn't join. So I hope everybody feels comfortable with recording. Otherwise, we have to ask you now politely uh, to leave and the uh, recordings will be uploaded on uh, different websites of our partners. You will also find the link in the chat and also our uh, on our project uh, Facebook site, uh, you can find uh, the recordings. Before uh, just like starting our session, I would like to uh, draw your attention to a little survey we want to do in the beginning. It's also something we be trying to do um, the first time during that webinar to get you interactive from the beginning. So you will see the link um, and it would be great if you can just um, uh, answer the brief um, questions uh, which had been um, uh, also our speakers have been contributed to that one. Uh, that would be great if you can just like start to open the survey link and answer the questions. So today uh, I would like to welcome uh, four speakers. Uh, so the first one is Dr. Musa Gunamat. He was also joining us uh, last week from the Ministry of Education. Um, and we have uh, Laureen Lichtmann from Learning Equality joining us today from the US. We have um, Zeyna Jadan uh, from UNHCR Jordan, a colleague from Jordan, great to, uh, to see you. And we have Sian Tesni from CBM, Christoffel Blind Mission, uh, joining us today from the UK. Uh, the webinar series, as some of you uh, already know, is in the uh, we started to have the idea uh, when uh, the COVID-19 uh, lockdown prevention measurements happening and all over the globe kind of every schools have been closed. So and uh, that happened just like a few weeks after we have launched together with our partner, the um, inclusive 10 years inclusive education strategy. So, and in order like to make use also and start further implementing the strategy, even under these difficult circumstances, we decided let us like have a webinar series, let us bring different experts, uh, colleagues from around the globe together and discuss together how, how can inclusive education happen 
under current circumstances, but also in the light of um, looking already ahead. Because I mean, I think like um, everybody recognized, especially in a situation like that one and also that happening in different other crisis situations, it's uh, very difficult to reach the most vulnerable um, target groups. and part of them are children with disabilities and this is also something we saw happening uh, during the current crisis so i think it's very important that again we remind each other on the commitment on the promise which had been made and also the commitment in jordan uh, under the umbrella of the 10 years uh, inclusive education uh, strategy uh, and talking about the 10 years um, inclusive education strategy, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Musa again. He is the head of Students with Disability Programs Directorate at the Ministry of Education in Jordan. He has um, 24 years of experience in the education within the Ministry of um, Education and um, he holds a PhD in special education learning difficulties. And uh, thank you, Dr. Musa, for joining us today. And I will hand over now uh, to you to explain to the participants um, our current session under the umbrella of the 10 year strategy for inclusive education. Shukran, Stephanie. أود أن أجدد شكري لكافة الأشخاص المعنيين بالتنسيق لسلسلة المؤتمرات الافتراضية من مديرية إدارة التعليم ومديرية برامج الطلبة المعاقين في الوزارة التربية والتعليم والزملاء من المجلس الأعلى ومنظمة الجي آي زد بداية أود أن أرحب بكافة الحضور والمشاركين لحضور المؤتمر الافتراضي الثالث كما تم مشاركته خلال المؤتمرات الافتراضية السابقة فقد قامت وزارة التربية والتعليم بالتعاون مع المجلس الأعلى لحقوق الأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة وبدعم من منظمة الجي آي زد بإطلاق الاستراتيجية العشرية للتعليم الدامج في شهر يناير من العام الحالي الأمر الذي كان بداية مبشرة للتعليم الدامج في المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية من منطلق منهجية التعليم للجميع تستند الاستراتيجية العشرية للتعليم الدامج على مصادقة الأردن على اتفاقية حقوق الأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة رقم 20 والتي تم إطلاقها عام 2017 إضافة إلى التأكد من تحقيق الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة والمتعلق بالتعليم الجيد تتضمن الاستراتيجية تسع محاور تشمل كافة الجوانب التي يجب مراعاتها للتأكد من منهجية التعليم للجميع وقد قمنا بتطرق في المؤتمرين السابقين على أربع محاور من الاستراتيجية وأريد فقط بالتذكير في هذه المحاور التي تم التعليق عليها محور السياسات والتشريع ومن ثم محور التوعية والإعلام وكسب التأييد ومحور التعرف والتشخيص ومحور إمكانية الوصول واليوم إن شاء الله سوف أقوم نقوم بتغطية محور التعلم والتعليم البرامج التربوية والتي يعني ترتبط بشكل مباشر بالمؤتمر الافتراضي لهذا اليوم وهو مناهج عملية لدعم كافة المتعلمين في المنازل توفير تعليم نوعي متميز لجميع الطلبة بما فيهم الطلبة ذوي الإعاقة ضمن النظام المدرسي هو هدف التعليم الدامج ومن خلال تعديل أساليب التعليم والمناهج الدراسية والخطط التعليمية ونأخذ بعين الاعتبار والحسبان المتطلبات التربوية الخاصة للطلبة ذوي الإعاقة إعادة النظر في البرامج التربوية التقليدية أصبح أمرا ضروريا من أجل مواءمة هذه البرامج وتعديلها بحيث تتوافق مع الطلبة ذوي الإعاقة وقد قامت الوزارة اعتمادا على الموارد الحالية المتوفرة وبالتعاون 
مع المجلس الأعلى لحقوق الأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة على موائمة البرامج التربوية استجابة لجائحة كوفيد-19 وتمت موائمة هذه المناهج بحيث قمنا بتصوير حصص بلغة الإشارة على ثلاث مراحل للطلبة الصم أول مرحلة كانت مرحلة الثانوية العامة فكان يتم التسجيل ومن ثم بعث هذا التسجيل على قناة تيو... قناة تيوب للمجلس الأعلى ومن ثم بعثها إلى منصات الوزارة المعتمدة المرحلة الثانية كانت الصفوف الثلاثة الأولى الصف الأول والثاني والثالث الأساسي والمرحلة الأخيرة اللي هي كانت مرحلة من الصف الرابع إلى العاشر الأساسي ومن ثم عملنا مع الطلبة المكفوفين حيث قمنا بتصوير بتصوير عن طريق برامج الزوم واليوتيوب والواتس أب تفاعل مع الطلبة من ذوي الإعاقة البصرية وقامت الوزارة أيضا بإرسال ضوابط تقييم الطلبة ذوي الإعاقة خلال هذه الفترة أه نتمنى الآن التنسيق يعني التنسيق لتسجيل الفصل الدراسي الأول للطلبة الصم والطلبة المكفوفين والتركيز على الصف الأول الأساسي المحور المحور يعني إحنا حكينا دخلنا أشياء بعضها المحور اللي, اللي اليوم نتحدث عنه الهدف منه كخطة استراتيجية عشرية اللي هي تطوير المناهج واستراتيجيات التعليم ونظام الامتحانات لتتوافق مع متطلبات التعليم الدامج الاستفادة من الممارسات العالمية في إجراءات التعليم الدامج تسخير التكنولوجيا المساندة في تعليم الطلبة ذوي العاقة داخل الغرفة الصفية تطوير برامج وأدلة لمتطلبات تعليم الطلبة ذوي الإعاقة الذهنية والإعاقات الشديدة ممن لا يمكن للمناهج بشكلها الراهن مواكبة متطلباتهم التعليمية إلزام المؤسسات التعليمية بتنفيذ برامج التعليم الدامج وتهيئة الطلبة ذوي الإعاقة الملتحقين بمراكز ومدارس التعليم المنفصلة لدمجهم في المدارس العادية تطوير إجراءات موحدة لتكييف المناهج الدراسية للطلبة ذوي الإعاقة في النهاية أود أن أذكر الجميع أن التعليم الدامج بحاجة إلى تكاتف كافة الجهود من قبل أصحاب العلاقة والخبرات المختلفة ومشاركة المجتمع المحلي من أجل العمل على تحقيقه ومن خلال سلسلة المؤتمرات الافتراضية نهدف لتبادل الخبرات ورفض الخبرات المحلية بخبرات ومعلومات جديدة بما يتعلق بالتعليم للجميع وخصوصا خلال الأوقات الحالية انتظرونا في المؤتمر الافتراضي القادم ونتمنى نتمنى أن أن يكون وصلت المحور بشكل جيد Thank you, Dr. Musa. Thank you. Um, yes. And um, and I know, I mean, like, uh, I haven't understood everything because I couldn't listen simultaneously, but I hope our participants did. But I know already because we hadn't been in cl close contact in the last months, and I know all the efforts like the Ministry of Education has been doing uh, to reach most of their students. But of course, again, challenges have been uh, there to reach the most vulnerable, uh, but also like uh, children with disabilities. So I'm really excited also uh, to listen to um, the work of uh, Lorene Lichtman um, from the organization Learning Quart uh, Equality and Sena Jadan from UNHCR in the next presentation and uh, before starting let me just like introduce uh, Lauren to you she's working in the project and I think like sorry Savine I think it's your microphone 
which is still switch on. Thank you. So Loreen is working in the project partnerships lead for the nonprofit organization Learning Equality. She's passionate about collaboration for innovations to extermine barriers to education. So all children and youth have the right to quality, quality education realized. Uh, her recent work has focused on supporting corporates engaging in education and the use of ed tech for learning. And I'm sure you'll explain a bit more about that one in a bit. And uh, Saina Jadan is the head of, edu uh, of the education unit and the country coordinator for the civil society network for displacement uh, at UNHCR Jordan office. She has long experience in the family protection and child protection portfolios in Jordan, promoting the protection of refugee children and families. And she advocates for inclusive, accessible and equal innovative education for refugees and vulnerable uh, Jordanian uh, learners. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, to uh, your uh, presentations and Lorene will start uh, to give us an insight about the open source learning platform Colibri uh, and, ha uh, and uh, how it has been adapted um, and used globally during the pandemic. And uh, Saina will her start her presentation after Lorene and discussing uh, like learning at home um, in, in Jordan and especially in the light for um, vulnerable children. So Lorene, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. And uh, Lorene, oh. if you don't mind, maybe you can switch on your camera for, for one uh, uh, 10 seconds. So also our uh, audience has a picture, you know, who's talking. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And, yes, and Ali, maybe you can just quickly show Lorene. And can you can just start, yes. Great, okay, I now have lost um, my, my presentation. Um, just bear with me for a second. We can see your presentation. So if it already help, helps you now, I think it's like switch off. I think you have to connect it again. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, apologize. I have to apologize. Of course. <laughs> I'm not um, super well versed with Microsoft Teams. Great. Can you see my presentation? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Hi, everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well during these uncertain times. It's an honor for me to be joining you today and to share a bit more about what my organization, Learning Equality, does and, and how we've been supporting learners globally in response to COVID. At Learning Equality, we've developed an open source education um, learning platform called Calibri, and it's an ecosystem of products because we care about equity. We've always been focused on reaching the most marginalized. And in light of the current pandemic, um, those communities are even harder to reach and the equity gap will widen. So the issues that we've been working on to address, such as limited or unreliable internet, limited hardware and our infrastructure, limited time for discoverability of quality relevant resources, or general lack of openly available relevant digital learning materials are becoming increasingly apparent as we move towards distance learning solutions in response to COVID. And, and I think we've seen a lot of that over the last couple of months. So this is exactly what we do. Um, we kind of sit at the intersection between building um, products and, and leveraging different tools to support the use of open educational resources and make them available to disconnected communities in a way that really supports learning. Because the problem is so significant, we're designing our solutions to be scalable and sustainable. Um, we've taken advantage of the huge wealth of open educational resources that is available already online, including many in Arabic, and we work with partners to develop new, new content as well. Um, our products generally run on low cost and legacy devices, meaning we're able to take advantage of what hardware already exists, as well as supplement with new. Um, and again, it runs completely offline. 
But when there is internet, we like to take advantage of that too um, in, in ways that are responsible. So our Calibri learning platform is open source and it's, it's at the center of this ecosystem to provide offline access to a curated and openly licensed educational content library with tools for pedagogical support for differentiated and personalized learning. It's intended for use in low resource and low connectivity contexts. And like its predecessor platform called K Lite, which brought the Khan Academy videos and exercises offline, it's designed to run on low cost and legacy hardware. Because Calibri is designed for offline first, it supports a distribution and access model that responds to the needs in these contexts. In this way, essential, essentially many learning hubs are created when some of the tools and support to educators that are often made available online are now made available offline with considerations given for learning in these contexts. One thing that's incredibly important for us um, is to ensure that we've designed for accessibility. And during the COVID pandemic, um, we realized where learning equality can play a role, but also where some of the limitations are. So in designing our learning platform, um, we've demonstrated our commitment to accessibility through the core values of our organization, the transparency and the documentation that we have on how to use the platform um, and making sure that there is inclusion in our product development and design phases and that we're able to leverage learning resources that have been designed for inclusivity. Our learning platform itself has partial WGAC 2.1 level AA conformance with some level AAA success um, criteria. And so this is really the focus on web accessibility standards because Calibri is a browser-based solution um, at its core. And we also have multimodal learning resources. So caption audio and video formats, more interactive transcripts, HTML, PDF, and EPUB reading materials where you can adjust size and also allow for self-paced learning. Um, but we're also very uh, cognizant of some of the limitations to using a platform of this nature at home. I'd like to note that Calibri is designed to be um, inclusive and it, where adaptive plugins and devices can be used for accessibility, it's able to support. But recognizing that um, during this time at home in the pandemic that these tools might not be as readily accessible. Um, and so it, it might be a bit more challenging to leverage for an inclusive um, approach. But in general, the platform is really designed for inclusivity and we work through our documentation and through our implementing partners to help to support on the implementation of its use. Our designs in general are oriented around contexts where there might be limited social interaction at some point. Um, even if one is learning by oneself, we'd always anticipated that there would be a central social point to update content or to sync data for educators to review and provide some more personalized support. Um, but in response to COVID, recognizing that learners were at home as well as educators, our team has developed a five part response strategy. The first is focusing on implementation and pedagogical support, which I'll get into on the next slide, um, but really focusing deeply on what learning resources are most relevant to support both educators and learners as well as caregivers at home. What additional materials can be brought on to support in learning about the COVID pandemic? Um, our third part is about adapting our product roadmap to really respond to the needs and realities that we are hearing. Um, We've designed, we've continued to develop a feature set that's responsive to needs and during COVID has been no exception. Um, the fourth area is supporting innovative solutions um, to support access and distribution of the platform. And you'll hear from Zaina in a bit what's been done in Jordan and I can share a bit more about um, a few examples of some other countries, but happy during the Q&A to, to elaborate further. And the fifth is on advocacy and collaboration. And I really consider this webinar today to be an example of that, where we can share um, some of the issues that we work on on a daily basis um, related to some of the barriers to accessing quality learning materials in environments that um, have more limited connectivity and really engaging around what that looks like in response to the COVID pandemic. So for at-home home use of Calibri during COVID, um, First, um, we're, 
we've helped to support learners to take advantage of what has already existed before the pandemic. Um, so that includes the Calibri Learning Platform, its content library in various languages, including in Arabic, for different grade levels and subjects. The second is our Calibri Studio Curricular Tool, which helps to support the alignment of digital resources to curricular standards. Um, immediately in response to COVID, we looked to see what we could do um, in the immediate response. And so the first things we did included expanding our toolkit of how to documentation on how to set up Calibri in five easy steps so that it would be more accessible. Um, our learning platform is very well documented, but recognizing um, that not all of us um, have high levels of digital literacy. And so setting up these materials to be able to um, install Calibri at home was supported with, with this documentation. Um, we've developed new pedagogical resources to support at home learning, which I'll discuss on the next slide. Um, we've updated our content library with additional content that's been aligned to different country curriculum, as well as COVID specific materials. Um, so this is in addition to the already two dozen or so resources that we've had in Arabic, for example, but having a much stronger health on, on a stronger focus on mental health. Um, and the third is on a library catalog to support improved content discoverability. So when Calibri is downloaded, it actually comes empty. It's one of the reasons um, that we've been able to design for inclusivity and really understand the, um, the environments in which Calibri is used. And so learners or um, administrators are able to pull in content into Calibri that makes the most sense for that learning environment. And so by having a, a library catalog, it helps to better understand what content might be usable and before one goes through the process of either downloading it from the internet or importing the content peer to peer or over our local area connection. The pedagogical guidance is <clears throat> one of the areas that I think is the most exciting. Um, we've supported um, initially in providing documentations for both educators, caregivers, and learners all in response to COVID. So for educators that might have access to Calibri at a distance where learners might not have support, we've provided documentation on how to use messaging platforms like WhatsApp to share resources with learners. Um, so where learners might not need to have access to the platform and all of its contents, but pedagogical support to educators to support them at a distance. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second is a guidance template to support facilitating with distance learning. As we all know that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, educators um, may not have all been prepared for this move to online learning. And so these are easy to use resources with that support. The second is support to caregivers. So recognizing that parents have now need to take the place of teachers um, and really supporting coaches at home or really to supplement what teachers have been doing and, and the great work that they've been doing. And so we provided a template to guide parents and guardians um, to support with this. And the third is for learners. Um, we've developed an activities choice board um, for self-directed learning. At present, it's really designed for the content that we have um, in English in our library, but working to build that out in other languages. And the, the, the rationale here is to help to support learners and take a bit more agency over their learning um, and, and to provide them with the resourcing on how to do that. So what's next? Um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be releasing a self-contained Android app to support use of Calibri on one's own um, with an improved onboarding experience, meaning um, making it easier to set Calibri up on your own. Um, additional learning resources for educators and caregivers with an, especially a focus on mental health and psychosocial support. Increased documentation to support implementing partners and ministries of education on how to use our Calibri Studio curricular tool to take um, supplemental content from our library and align it to national curricula in order to be used in the Calibri platform offline. And we've added support to pre-provision devices to support with better distribution. So that includes either working with telcos to put Calibri on a national level server um, or to preload tablets um, at scale. So my colleague Zeno will talk a bit more about examples during COVID um, in Jordan, but I just wanted to give three quick examples in which to, to stimulate how you might be thinking about different ways to use Calibri here in Jordan. Um, beyond the great work that Zena and her colleagues have done. So the first is in Uganda, um, where Calibri has been installed on a national level server um, 
provided by the National IT Authority and worked with UNICEF and the National Curricular Body to be able to make con take content that's been aligned to the curricula available to those that have internet online. And they're currently in the process of zero reading this with a telco, um, but also to make it available via Wi-Fi hotspots that are um, all, that the infrastructure already exists um, in and around the capital city. In the DRC, we're working with Vodafone Foundation um, that's using Calibri in a zero rated model and contents have been made available in French with an, a special focus on um, revision of past exams to help to support um, with, with some of the exams that are um, made available at the national level. Um, and this is available to both Vodafone subscribers and non-Vodafone subscribers on the public internet. Um, the Ministry of Education there has, has actually recommended that this platform be used to support the continuity of learning. And the third is on hardware distribution. Um, here in the US, an organization that supports the um, school districts has um, preloaded Raspberry Pis, which are these low cost computers to make Calibri with aligned content available to learners during this time. Um, so those are just a few examples and hope, I think that these links will be shared out afterwards, but there's lots of resources available to help um, you get started with Calibri, including exploring um, our demo site and our Arabic catalog. Um, I wanted to also draw your attention to a Facebook discussion page on COVID resources and distance learning that we've been facilitating during this time, as well as our, our um, response. So thank you so much. That was a very high level overview, but really excited to turn it over to Zaina to share a bit more about the work that we've been supporting UNHCR and Jordan. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Loreen. And I'm just like straight heading over to Zaina and maybe we do the same. So they have a face, uh, Zaina, before you start uh, doing your presentation. So in the next five seconds, we will share your picture <laughs> or your uh, video and uh, then you can start sharing uh, your presentation. Thank you, Zaina. Your microphone has to be, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lauren and Stephanie and uh, Dr. Musa, of course, from the ministry. It has always been a pleasure throughout the COVID response and before that, and we look forward to a positive continuation during and post COVID situation. I'll switch my camera now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and I will use my um, presentation. Sure. So does it show yet the presentation? Yes, it does. Yes. If you yeah. can switch to the presenter mode, I think that would help. And I think, Loreen, I still see that your microphone is on. Maybe you can switch it off. Sure. Yeah. And Great. yes, that's perfect. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So um, if you allow me, I would like to start by, of course, complimenting uh, what uh, Lauren has just comprehensively and uh, 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 swiftly explained about the, um, the Colibri platform. Is perhaps a question that would come to mind is, what is the link between UNHCR and innovation? UNHCR education, UNHCR and partnerships. So I would like to start by a very quick introduction just to put the scene uh, in, in clarity towards education, innovation, partnership within the UNHCR umbrella and to highlight then the um, how important the Colibri platform was a very important tool in terms of response. <clears throat> during the, the, the crisis. So as a lead for refugee protection, UNHCR maintains its commitment to support refugees and also the host governments until the solution for all refugees is identified. Of course, the provision and expansion of access to quality education for refugees is indeed among the protection priorities for the UNHCR. And this is the key link between protection and education, where protection is a key mandate. UNHCR seeks to increase and enhance access through leveraging technological and pedagogical advances, including expanding connected education programming, as a fact. As you may know, um, around 85% of the world's refugee under UNHCR's mandate are hosted in developing countries. And here comes, of course, our role in terms of ensuring the support to the national education systems 
and based on UNHCR's pledges to support national systems to assist host governments to fulfill their commitments to the refuge to the Jordanian learners to start with, and of course to the refugee protection, and by creating the conditions for inclusion of refugees and the persons of concerns into quality educational programs through their national educational systems. Right. So based on that, of course, every emergency preparedness and response, whether a war or conflict situation or the COVID scenario, which came as a, a surprise for everybody, still it's an emergency preparedness and response. It should integrate into national crisis sensitive sector plans, which here includes the education sector. And the capacity of governments and civil society should be enhanced to be able to rapidly respond and assess the educational needs in this crisis context, if we may call it. Uh, what is very important here also to highlight the whole society approach and the uh, shared responsibility concept, where in line with the 2018 Global Compact on Refugees and the 2030 Agenda, the UNHCR education strategy in Jordan and globally aims to foster the conditions of partnership, which is happening, and a great example is our partnership with Learning Equality and Google.org and many others, collaboration and innovation using innovative approaches that lead to all refugee and their hosting community to be able to access inclusive and equitable quality education for all. This very much aligns and I'm sure most of the participants, including our GIZ colleagues and of course Dr. Musa and the ministry colleagues know that all this does align with the education strategic plan which aligns with the International Education 2030 framework and with the SDG4 um, and of course with the Jordan response plan that includes vulnerable Jordanians and refugees. It's worth highlighting that the National Education Strategic Plan is anchored in the goals of the Human Resource Development Strategy, where ICT in education is one of the Human Resources Development Strategy themes, which is addressed under Quality, Education and Education Strategic Plan. So based on that, when the UNHCR Jordan Office developed their education strategy, we took all those different elements into consideration while developing the education strategy with, of course, a, a great focus on the use of technology and innovation in serving the refugee learners. And here comes, of course, the importance of connected learning through the support of the Connected Learning in Crisis Consortium and, and the partners within that consortium. Where, where the focus was on an approach that focuses on innovative form of education that uses information technology, ideally to combine face-to-face -face and online learning, ideally. Its methods have been particularly successful in, in low resource and marginalized learning contexts. And here started the whole relationship um, uh, with our uh, learning equality colleagues and google.org with their support. Uh, we adapted a global learning platform and we established the so-called connected learning hubs in Jordan. Those 10 connected learning hubs in Jordan are hosted in Princess Basma Center, Marakiz Al Amira Basma, Juhud, in 10 governorates. Those connected learning platforms, uh, center, sorry, they host the Colibri platform which is in Arabic, which makes it even more accessible, and it can be accessed by Jordanian learners and refugee learners equally alike. What was interesting about those connected learning hubs is that the coaches and the facilitators were mainly identified among the refugee population, plus, of course, some Jordanian coaches and facilitators as well. They were all trained on the Colibri platform, how to access it, how to utilize the content of it, and, and it has really showed excellent access uh, prior to the COVID-19 in our community centers in the field. Right. It's mainly it was mainly seen as a learning support platform. It never replaced the Ministry of Education curriculum at all, yet rather supporting. Whatever was taught at schools 
noting the overburdened situation for teachers, for the ministry, for the schools and for the learners as well. So it came as a very interesting learning support platform. We continued our work and through an NGO, a national NGO called Madrasati, uh, we uh, managed to do curriculum alignment for 60% of the uh, Colibri platform, which was aligned with the content of the Colibri platform, which was aligned to the Ministry of Education curriculum. During the COVID response, and here we started to see some interesting um, advancements <laughs> to the situation. The Ministry of Education and the Queen Rania Center for Information Technology were very interested about the fact that the content was aligned, about the fact that the content is in Arabic, about the fact that the, the platform can host different types of learning material, not only videos, but also worksheets, etc. And we worked together on, 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 on supporting the ministry of hosting the Colibri platform on the Noor Space channel, which is the formal channel for the Ministry of Education for Distant Learning, as you all know, which was identified during the COVID-19, and which was expected to be accessed by 2 million students and 100,000 teachers, at least at the very beginning of the crisis. That was the vision of the Ministry of Education. The COVID response and how did the Colibri platform help us? As you know, with the lockdown, um, all schools were closed. Even our community centers were closed where the Colibri platform was hosted and, and, and the connected learning hubs were closed. So we and, and the, the fact that we were using the Colibri platform, as Lauren explained earlier, more as an offline platform took us for you know few days in in a, in a, in an overwhelming situation is that how can we best still use that platform and luckily colibri does function online when needed and that helped us to 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 continue the learning support programs which was even needed more during the response because the televised lessons and the online uh, classrooms were not necessarily academically suf sufficient for learners, whether Jordanians or refugees. So again, Colibri platform came as an excellent learning support tool during this um, difficult situation. So the COVID response uh, helped us actually <laughs> to shift and we helped the learners by shifting to virtual classrooms from completely offline classrooms to fully online classrooms. And this actually required a lot of work with the coaches and facilitators. As you know, yes, they were experts in some educational uh, subjects to be able to deliver the content face to face when, we're, when they were in the centers. Yet it was quite challenging to identify who among them has the technical capacity to do and to deliver those classrooms online. And some of them we had to train actually virtually on how to uh, provide virtual classrooms. So the shifting to virtual classrooms, one of the key responses where Colibri had the flexibility. Uh, we also did some readapting of pedagogy and content to be accessed from home. So a lot of the classes were re recorded pre prior the class and then delivered during the class and then showing the content of the Colibri classroom, which was again a, a readaptation of pedagogy. Of course, boosting connectivity, as you know, yani I'm sure our participants from Jordan and even globally uh, do realize that we had some uh, connectivity issues, uh, especially inside camps and also in some urban uh, uh, contexts. Um, however, the work that the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Higher Education, UN agencies, donors, had strengthened uh, the communication with telecommunication companies and managed to boost um, um, well the connectivity. This does not mean that all problems were solved, but we have noticed the, 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 that the situation has definitely enhanced and we received less and less complaints from learners with regards to the connectivity problems. Reached out to more than 4,000 Jordanian and refugee learners during the last two months virtually through the virtual classes, which was absolutely one key achievement as well, noting that 45% of the learners were male and 55% of the learners were female. For the colleagues who are interested in gender uh, related issues within the education sector, I thought it might be interesting to, to, to highlight the gender component here. 
Um, and challenges against uh, inclusion, we of course face some challenges. It's not a perfect scenario. However, we've been working all together on how best can we respond to those challenges. Um, uh, of course, the limited number of smart devices. This has been absolutely one of the key problems. Uh, most of the learners did not even have a smart device or some of them had a small smartphone but not necessarily the most accessible for the learning experience. Poor internet connection, especially in camps, as I mentioned earlier. The lack of basic needs did disable refugees from recharging their phones or purchase additional credit. So again, we go back to the key question, livelihood and basic needs. Also specialized tools and human support, again, which I highlighted, especially when we were working with some of the facilitators and reaching out to the most vulnerable children with disabilities. Despite the challenge with regards to children with disabilities, yet still we managed to reach them out using technology. Where most of the counseling sessions that were delivered for parents or were delivered to the uh, learners themselves, most of them were also shifted to take place virtually to the extent possible. All these achievements and all those challenges would have not been able to, 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 to reach or achieve without the valuable collaboration. And here comes back the importance of the whole society approach and the shared responsibility concept between the government, donors, private sector, NGOs, national and international organizations, um, as well academia networks, media, and certainly last but not least, the communication with communities and ensuring a community-based approach. Noting that refugees and Jordanians have a lot of capacities and potential where we can, they can also contribute to the, to the response mechanism when it comes to the challenges. Um, due to the limitations of time, I will stop here. I hope that I managed to give you a clear <laughs> image and understanding about the situation, and I will continue to be on standby for any further question uh, coming up soon. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thanks, Thanks a lot, a lot uh, Reina. Reina. Maybe you can, Maybe switch, you can switch, switch off your microphone off. because it's always creating a bit of an echo of two of us try to speak. Thank you, Reina. Um, and also, again, thank you to Lorene. I um, I think it, it brought a great overview again because, like, I'm I'm not too sure about our uh, participants, but at least like uh, the participants from Jordan, they surely heard about Colibri and the different efforts, um, like different organizations like UNHCR, but also UNICEF and the Ministry of Education had to facilitate online and offline learning. But it was like great to get a bit of a deeper understanding of what happened in the last months. And uh, I'd like to hand over to Sreen, who uh, just like um, uh, will give us a bit of an overview of what happened in the chat. I think there was a, another comment and then uh, David will say something about um, the uh, little survey we did in the beginning. So Sreen. Hello everyone. Uh, so uh, um, basically the comments like we received one of the comments uh, from Afaf uh, Hussein. Uh, she stated that uh, based on her personal experience uh, that she dealt with the student with the disability and uh, with the support of the parents and uh, the continuous uh, support and follow up uh, she managed uh, through uh, I think because she didn't share it I think through the organization that she worked with uh, to mainstream and uh, include uh, the student and one of the public schools and she also highlighted that uh, there's a lot of cases uh, of, of students with disability that uh, need uh, our attention, our joint attention, and to be supported uh, in order to ensure that they're receiving their rights in education. Uh, so this is uh, basically uh, one of the uh, participation of uh, the one of the participants in uh, the webinar. So I will hand now to uh, David. Uh, I'm sure he has uh, like uh, more uh, excited, uh, excited think more uh, participation in the survey. Uh, so David, uh, here you are. Thank you, Savine. Um, yes, indeed, we had a few results on the survey. I know it was for the participants a little bit short notice. Um, we prepared this questionnaire a bit before the webinar starts by purpose. 
we wanted to collect some, let's say, opinions from your side. And um, we will share the results in a few minutes. So right now we're um, collecting the results and we will share with them. We will share the results in the chat. And uh, most probably, I think our one of our speakers, Sian, will also make reference to these uh, to these um, questions or to these answers. Um, yes, but you will see the answers in English and Arabic in a in a few minutes. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so uh, before, like the participants will, uh, uh, we will share the um, answers um, in the chat. I would like to introduce uh, Sian again. Uh, it's great to meet you um, online and you joining us today from the UK. And Sian Tesni um, is an international global advisor for education at uh, CBM. She's uh, also a qualified teacher uh, of learners who are deaf or hard of hearing. And since uh, 1991, uh, she has been involved in development work and humanitarian action related to inclusive education uh, in low uh, middle income countries. Her work includes experience in developing policy, guidelines, advocacy, capacity development, and service provision related to inclusive education. Uh, Sian is also a coordinator of the International Disability and Development Inclusive Education uh, Task Group. And it's really um, uh, a pleasure to have you today with us in the webinar series. Um, and uh, today you will uh, discuss the question uh, about are children with learning difficulties given the right support? And uh, you will present us um, the disability Disability Inclusive Community Action COVID-19 Matrix. I'm very excited to learn more about that one in the next uh, minutes. Uh, and you will give us updates regarding education under COVID-19 from different uh, countries. And you will also share your sh uh, the challenges and lessons learned uh, which appeared in the last months during um, the pandemic. So, uh, Sian, the floor is yours and we will do it as we did with the other presenters. We will uh, share your video for the first uh, few seconds so people uh, get to know how you look like and uh, then you can just like share your uh, presentation. Thank you. Your microphone, yeah. Just to say, um, nice to be here and uh, we'll, I'll speak shortly, but I know that you won't be able to see the interpretation while you have me as well. So really lovely to be here with you today. Let me now share my uh, presentation. slideshow. On the slideshow now. Yeah, no, the, uh, you still have to uh, press the present present button on the, uh, but we can see your slides. Well, can you see it? Is it in, in presentation mode? No, or? it isn't. Right, okay, let me just try that again. Okay. Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sean Tesney and working for CBM as Global Advisor for Education. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here today and to have learned so much from what has been said already by Dr. Muta and our colleagues from uh, discussing the Colibri um, online and offline platform for learning as well. Um, David mentioned at the beginning there. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I cannot really go into the results of the, the three questions related to the technical because I can't get the chat box up and have myself in presentation mode. Um, but I can say that to the um, universal design for learning question, most people uh, went for the B option, which is the principle for op um, optimizing teaching and learning for all boys and girls and the first option principle for good building design for learning and I will come to that in a little while. So what exactly it meant. I was struck when I was looking through the uh, 10 year 
strategy for inclusive education by the by the strapline, our rights are one, our methods are different. And I don't think in any other time, but now has that message been even clearer. Children's rights are one to access education in whatever method, in whatever situation um, they find themselves in. And this pandemic has made us think differently in the way we present education. And our methods do have to be different. And this, if we like to look at it as an opportunity, has given us a, a opportunity and made us consider what different methods we need to have in place to ensure accessibility for all and inclusive education as a right for everyone. So in this brief presentation, I'll just give a brief overview of the Disability Inclusive Communication Action COVID-19 matrix developed within CBM, the organisation I work with, provide a brief global um, overview of the situation related to education during COVID-19 so far, to share some challenges, lessons learned and ways forward, and then what would building back better or reimagining education look like fi to finish off. In front of you, there's a, a matrix called the Disability Inclusive Communication Action to COVID-19. And this was developed by CBM not only for education, but for all our work related to community based inclusive development. And the idea is that it um, aims to provide community programs a guidance to possible actions um, during this pandemic and how to mobilize um, funds and how to mobilize action within communities in preparedness and response to the situation. So this has helped to guide our partners and guide our reutilizing of funds and uh, changing uh, certain activities within our program partner <clears throat> and what they are providing in education. Particularly today, uh, the, the five, sorry, the five um, columns of the matrix are related to compassion, communication, networks, participation, and access. And for today's session, in particular, looking at remote learning or distance education, I would say that we are most certainly needing to look at communication, ensuring messages are accessible to all. Networks, we can't look at ensuring accessibility or alternative communication without consulting and working with persons with disabilities themselves. And as Zaina said at the end of her <coughs> talk, you know, working across the community, be that government, be that private sector, be that NGO, be that parents, parents as our partners. So during this pandemic, um, as been said many times, but we know that in April this year, uh, at that point, over 190 countries had school closures impacting on all children and their families, because let's not forget, closing school means that children have to be at home. Parents, and I know many, many uh, colleagues and friends have faced this challenge of balancing um, home working and home educating and home care. At one point, over 1.5 billion learners were affected right across the globe from preschool right through to tertiary education in low, middle and high income countries. So many children have many children and families have faced the challenge of balancing how they go about this. And has it worked? That's the other question we need to ask ourselves. Even before the pandemic, we knew that 50 percent of out of school children were those with, with disabilities. We knew that learners with disabilities generally um, had a gap between them and their peers without disabilities. They were more likely to drop out. And we also know from experience when, when children from not only disabilities, but from many marginalized groups, when there is a spell without education, it's much more challenging to get them back into education. 
girls become pregnant in, during during this pandemic and then they are not able to go back to school. Children, because of their family situations where possibly parents have lost their jobs or they are required to work in different ways, they too don't go back to school because now they also take on different tasks. And in the vast majority of homes, even now in, in high income as well as low income countries, it's been found that females in particular are the ones who've taken over the child care, as well as the feeding, as well as the education. And this has led to a, a great deal of stress in many homes. Sometimes children with disabilities require additional care. They require rehabilitation, speech and language therapy, and these have to continue. And again, many parents have found this quite stressful and emo emotionally uh, difficult to manage this work life providing food balance. And how do you provide food if there is no money coming into your house? Without food, children cannot learn. And therefore, um, there are many issues that have been related. Gender based violence have also increased during this time. Schools are more than just buildings for learning. They're also the providers of access to um, programs, food programs, social support, personal assistance and medical care. Children and young persons with disabilities are amongst some of the most affected in the marginalized groups that we are looking at. As a breakdown of support structures can increase their vulnerability, disrupt protection systems and expose them to discrimination and violence. So as I mentioned earlier, is distance education the answer for all learners? We've heard some innovative practices today, but are teachers ready for this approach? And could there be innovations in this current situation? Alternative arrangements are being made for children to learn from home, and those arrangements were, were made quite early on. Sending resources home, online education, radio, TV, Zoom, YouTube, you name it, there are so many um, possibilities. But access though to those possibilities can be very challenging. Not everyone has access to the internet. Accessibility for all learners is not systematically considered, resulting in excluding some children with disabilities and or learning difficulties. How can, for example, can children learn via the radio if they are deaf or hard of hearing or have certain learning disabilities? So we need to invest in rethinking and recapitalizing how we train our teachers learning about universal design for learning and how to use that those principles. Tomorrow, the Global Education Monitoring Report on Inclusion and Education, All Means All, will be published and there will be many um, learnings that we will have, many recommendations that we will have coming from that. And there is one particular uh, chapter related to COVID-19, so it will be really up to the minute. Look out for it tomorrow. So what are the good practices that we know have been instrumental in making learning work for all children? Well, we've seen that the twin track approach, that means using universal design for learning principles to not only provide systems, but also look at individual needs looking at how the information that's um, used to teach children at the moment, how is that being prepared for inclusion of all learners, and then ensuring that the reasonable accommodations of each learner are met. If you want to know some uh, or, or seek some very good uh, resources, you can go to the Interagency Network on Education and Emergencies, and I've left uh, a link there for when you have this um, presentation shared with you. One of the key important things that's been really um, useful in terms of, of a role for educators and uh, to families at this point time has been the awareness about COVID-19 and how to keep safe. The inclusive, accessible digital learning and resources. 
ensuring teachers resources are available, home based learning and psychosocial support. It's been mentioned before, but the link between home and school has never been so important as now. There are plenty of free resources online. We've heard today about Colibri, but there are also others called Notepad, Microsoft Learner Center and Ikitabo, another one that's used in East Africa where they have um, online um, uh, books in, in uh, accessible format for all children and they've used these storybooks as part of the um, teaching and reading on TVs in uh, certain countries in uh, Western Africa. But digital learning doesn't work for all children unless it is uh, accessible, that it's freely available, that the internet is also reaching um, remote areas and some countries have um, assisted in ensuring working with telecommunication um, companies to help provide some accessibility towards the remote um, areas at this time. I know within our partner programs we've been helping to provide funds to give loans of smart phones or accessible formats or access to the internet so that parents and families can join online wherever this is possible. There are so many printable materials, core lessons, play ideas, stories, stories about COVID-19 and a huge plethora of multimedia approaches. So what are the good practices for teachers? As I said before, this whole home and um, school or the contact with school has been incredibly important. Teachers in some of our partner programs have been trained to, because teachers before were not trained to use distance education, use online facilities, but now using and training, using this opportunity to train them in order that they can work better with parents, help set up parents groups so that parents can help each other, um, have been very some very innovative um, programs. Parents are actually producing films, little video clips that they can share with other parents using what is available in the home, in the surroundings where they are living in order to have basic um, readily available resources using fruit and vegetables and things that they have at home to, to, to do art, to teach maths and so on. But it has been important that teachers and parents and their children keep in regular contact. Not, not just about education alone, but providing psychosocial support ensuring the well-being of parents themselves as well as children. Making sure that learning is fun and varied and ensuring that, that their safeguarding issues are dealt with in a proper manner. And where social distancing is required um, to, by bringing children together, this is adhered to according to the country's own rules and regulations. Utilising community based inclusive development workforce, health workers, teachers and other people in the community to help raise awareness has been very important. Ensuring that people understand fully what can be done to mitigate COVID-19, not to be over fearful, but yet secure and safe. Sometimes it's community workers who deliver the home based materials where there are no where there is no access to Internet that they have to literally take the materials from house to house collecting Braille material and so that it can be marked and uh, <clears throat> and that there can be continued support. Sharing resources with each other, play ideas and parent to parent support groups. So our new normal has meant that we've gone from face to face to a virtual reality. We've gone from close work to social distancing. We've gone from teachers and field workers to mothers, fathers and siblings being partners in our education um, uh, format. Going from support in centre based or institutions 
to community-based and families being the implementers. But building back better, what will that mean to us? Well, COVID-19 is something that is going to be around with us. It's not going to be one day we have a cure and one day it will be finished. We know from Beijing, uh, South Korea, uh, Singapore, where at one point they thought COVID-19 was finished and yet it came back. We've, we know that certain countries are now um, closing down certain areas where, where the virus, where once had gone, has come back again. So social distancing, hygiene, well-being, catching up is something apart the home and the school being partners in this program is something that is going to be a part of us. And isn't this an opportunity maybe to actually consider how we reimagine education to be truly in inclusive, using the opportunity to ensure universal design for learning, flexible assessments, learning outcomes being different, ensuring the well-being of children are truly met and that being central to our learning process. If children are not happy, they are, they are fearful, they cannot learn. But this provides us a platform to go forward to use a variety of ways for, for learning and for teaching. Ensuring support from resource centres to remote areas. And this again, we've come back from some of our partners have said, we didn't realise before that we could use our resource centres, use the technology and train parents in the village without them having to come to the hundreds of miles to travel to spe for specialist support. This is an opportunity to promote diversity in our schools, which will lead to more resilient, peaceful society. Education is a human right, but it is also an investment in the future. We cannot ignore education. Health has to be looked at, of course, in this pandemic, but we ignore education at our peril. Human capital needs investment for prosperity tomorrow, and we can only do that together in joint partnerships. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Sian, uh, for this uh, presentation and the inspiring ending and reminding everybody again, like on the importance of education and the promise to education and the right to education uh, for everyone. Um, so thanks for the uh, presentation. I will hand over like uh, to David and Serene because I, um, I saw and I heard like that there are some uh, questions coming up but um and also please like uh encourage anybody if they if there are also um, new question comments please just uh, use the chat we have about 15 minutes left and we should make use of that 15 minutes thank you stephanie um yes indeed um uh, in english i can see three questions and uh, that are, in my opinion, directed to Laura and Zeyna, but I think um, Sian could also, if she wants to intervene as well. The first question is, if there are any, if there are some specific content developed for children with cognitive difficulties for distance learning? And the second question, if there are parental tips for supporting children with cognitive disabilities, uh, especially in their learning routine? And the third question is more concerning uh, if I understood West statistics, if there is a breakdown related to the access and use of Colibri by children with disabilities. Zaina or Lauren, would you like to answer the, these questions or at least one of the questions? Sure, so I can um, talk globally and then Zaina, perhaps you can jump in um, with specific information on Jordan. Um, so in general, I think it's important to clarify that learning equality itself doesn't create content, but rather we work with organizations that do create content um, in formats that we can make available in our platform. Um, so again, it could be a combination of radio programs alongside teacher training or teacher support materials with EPUBs um, like eKatabu that um, Sian, or that was just mentioned in the last presentation. So um 
In terms of contents de developed specifically for those with cognitive disabilities, um, we've worked with some organizations to be able to adapt um, storybooks to um, to support in more um, to support in EPUB file formats that are more accessible, although not necessarily directing those um, with cognitive disabilities. So we're always, our team is always looking for additional content to be able to make available. And if there are any particular resources that you know of, we would be very open um, to discussing those. And, and that includes parental tips as well. Um, similar to what Zaina mentioned, you know, we work very closely with partners and are reliant on them to be able to not only share um, what's working well and what they've seen, but also to be able to adapt it um, for use in different contexts. So I don't believe we have anything specifically targeting those um, types of learners beyond what I just mentioned, but it's not for a lack of um, interest and support, but rather um, perhaps a more limited awareness of what some of those materials are and perhaps more importantly, um, those materials that also have an open license. So something like a Creative Commons license, making the content um, more um, it, or easier for use um, in especially offline platforms, but just more generally in a, a free and publicly available way. Um, in terms of the breakdown um, statistically, it's a, a difficult question for me to answer because as I mentioned, Calibri is distributed offline and accessed offline, which means that if an organization or a user does not connect to the internet, um, we're unable to know that they exist. Um, and on top of that, um, we don't collect within the platform the type of information that you're requesting in order to be able to know whether or not um, we're supporting learners with um, specific learning needs. And so we would rely on partners that we are working with to be able to share that information um, back to us. Um, and so on that note, I'll, I'll um, transition it over to Zaina to see um, her thoughts as it relates specifically to Jordan. Very quickly, because Lauren has given the very general understanding, which is very factual and true. Frankly speaking, it is identified as a need that more content targeting children with disabilities need to be developed in Arabic and to be uploaded on the platform. Yani this is a fact and we're all working together trying to identify available content and perhaps developing new content uh, with, with um, relevant partners and actors. With regards to accessibility, frankly speaking, we're working with our partner, which is Juhud, and which they managed because the platform was accessed online. We managed to have weekly statistics and numbers. Yet what I wish to highlight here is that the program and the project that we have targeting children with disabilities educational program, which is the community based education, we call it, has quite limited numbers uh, that we're targeting. So even if we were able to share some numbers, they will be quite limited because the project that's targeting this particular group has uh, quite limited numbers. But what's also worth highlighting before I end is that Perhaps it was not necessarily the educational platform that was the educational content, sorry, that was most of help here because we still need to develop proper content, but it was the tool and the platform through which coaches, facilitators managed to reach out to children with disabilities and children with disabilities reach out to the learners, uh, to the coaches by itself as, as a tool, I mean, was absolutely of, of, of great um, help during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Zana. And just to add on, I, exactly, I think the challenge is just a limited availability. And so that's one of the reasons why initiatives like All Children's Reading begins with book, begin with books competition is so important. Um, so right now in Calibri, I mentioned the transcripts that we have, but we're also on working on bringing in additional resources available in sign language. Um, but it really goes back to the increasing the availability of these resources. And so th that's, um, yeah, I don't wanna, um, I hope I wasn't giving the impression that um, that there is a lot available because as Zana mentioned, there is a, a real lack of that. And so what we aim to do is work with partners to be able to make those resources more openly available. Thank you. Can, yes. I, can I add there? Yes, add please. There? Yeah, um, actually one of the, the innovations we found is actually partners working with state governments in order to 
work with them on, on what they have online, but ensuring it's um, accessible to all learners. And part of that is around ensuring easy read is available for learners with um, learning disabilities. One of the, uh, we mentioned in my presentation about parents working with parents to support their children. And one innovative approach I saw uh, from an example in India was a, a parent of a child with a learning disability through the support of the teachers had set up a little um, peer to peer uh, support group where they helped each other to work on a, a kind of a program of activities for the day. Making materials and, and stories, actually writing them themselves around the day's activities, sharing them together. And so they found all of a sudden that even though they were sharing online, they actually were able to then take these little, if you like, lessons and help them to ease them in the stress of the day by how to include their child with sometimes severe learning disabilities, sometimes mild learning disabilities, to ensure that they were not sitting in front of a book, not even being able to follow anything, but rather following the school program, but making it much more um, focused on the child's individual interests, strengths and needs. So I think it's a huge need. This is the big gap that we've found in COVID-19. We are, we are slowly getting there with accessibility, I would say, but there are great opportunities. And I think ministries of education, governments are finding ways of going forward to provide that accessible um, format, but it's working with persons with disabilities, the families and children in order to make it happen for the future. Yes. Thank you for uh, sharing your answer and um, uh, your answers. Uh, David Savine, is there something else you want to share from the chat? Um, yes, from my side, basically, uh, again, Nathaf, uh, uh, she said like basically that she's from uh, one of the public school in uh, Erbet Governorate. She asked a question, I think Lauren and Zena briefly uh, sort of answer it in a way. But I would like to ask it because she her, her question more targeted focus on students with disabilities. So the question said, what do you think is the evaluation of the distant learning processes during the Corona period uh, targeting children with disability? Uh, and the next question uh, also like from uh, one of the local CBOs. Uh, 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 threshold uh, knowledge for training and consulting. Uh, they actually, the question is uh, more for the questionnaire uh, related to the questionnaire. Uh, one of the question, uh, the question need to be either like, are we with uh, using online uh, platform or against it basically? Because from uh, based on her opinion uh, in Jordan, uh, we are still at the beginning of a comprehensive education that can be used in, uh, in the future using the online uh, platform. And uh, that need also like training and qualifying the teacher uh, on inclusive education plans and programs so that the teacher can discover the capability of their students using online uh, platforms. Uh, so uh, that's more like uh, for uh, the questionnaire question and uh, I leave the Lauren and Zena maybe they uh, could answer the question regarding the evaluation. Um, sure, actually, and of course, Lauren, you're most welcome to come and compliment or, or share what if you think uh, otherwise. But personally, from our experience, I do think that the blended approach continues to be the best approach and this has been a discussion clearly put in place earlier before the COVID-19. The use of technology is absolutely important. ICT, innovation, innovative approaches, this we can't ignore, we can't deny. However, it cannot completely replace the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and I think here, yes, again, I would completely um, be pro a blended approach. 
Um, yet what we have seen as an immediate response, at least that it managed the, the online learning, the connected learning, at least managed to keep the continuity of the educational process, which provided us from having a sudden cut and its impact on persons with disability. I still believe that human relations, connectivity, the human connectivity, not the technological connectivity, is absolutely of great importance, especially for people with disabilities. Yet the fact that we managed to keep uh, providing them with quiet, a semi-normal environment where they are still communicating, engaged, um, interacting was by itself a, a very positive experience. Um, I'll stop here and over to Lauren if she wishes to add anything. Yeah, just to supplement that, I think I we very much agree um, that a blended approach continues to be the best approach. And um, I think it's important when we say blended um, in a typical Calibri implementation, dur not during COVID, um, it's often the case that the learner to device ratio isn't one to one. Um, I think it looks different for learners with special needs given some of the assistive devices required, um, but oftentimes there's engagement happening outside of the platform, um, even when the platform is used. So again, the technology is just an enabler. And I think the way in which um, technology will continue to support in a blended way is to use um, Calibri alongside of other tools. Like I mentioned, sharing and connecting, sharing content and connecting via WhatsApp. Um, and really integrating these practices into the pedagogical approaches. Um, so, you know, it's blended in a different way, but the, the technology itself can support parents, educators, learners on how to actually learn outside of the technology with things that are available in your, in your environment. Um, and so I think that's true during COVID. It's obviously much more difficult, um, but we see, you know, technology not as the silver bullet solution, but something that can really help to leverage, uh, something that can be leveraged that to really support learning. In terms of evaluation, I think, you know, just listening to the global conversation, a lot of the initial focus on this first wave of COVID is on continuity of learning. And I think to Zaina's point, um, making sure that there's relevant materials that were, could be made available, um, relevant to the national curricula, would help to support with that continuity. But I think the reality is um, it's really hard to connect with people during these times. Everyone is overwhelmed. We're being very intentional with the type of information that we're collecting so that we're making the best use of people's time, um, limited time, and really trying to incorporate all those learnings into the platform and more importantly, our pedagogical support tools so that when there maybe are second waves or as um, Sian mentioned, just you know, um, additional instances of COVID, all over, around the world that were prepared in those instances for um, really supporting more quality learning experiences. And I, I think that's the reality. Um, that being said, we, when there are devices at home and there is some intermittent connectivity, we are hearing um, some positive feedback that's more anecdotal than measured um, in, in a clear way. So I think a lot of that remains to be seen, but focusing on continuity now, I think has helped to support with being realistic. Um, so that we can build better for the future. And I think that's that's part of the reality now, but um, is also reassuring that we'll be more prepared in the future. Thank you. Yes, thanks again. And looking at the time, we really reaching the end of our webinar. And uh, thanks again to all our presenters today. And thanks again for your lively um, participation. And I'd like to um, end also referring to Abia Mora, a colleague from the Ministry of Education, who uh, admitted also last time already um, that she will uh, also um, observe uh, the different presentation and also like uh, keep on track and summarizing the different lessons learned and uh, things from the presentation and today and I agree with you Abir um, it it has been indeed very interesting and very valuable um, not only I guess for the Ministry of Education but uh, all uh, other organizations also participating and I think I would like to end uh, with uh, 
what uh, was uh, referred from uh, Sian already that yes, indeed, tomorrow the Global Education Monitoring Report is launched and I think like it couldn't be a better time to again focus on inclusion and education. And uh, I really like their their title. They sh they choose all means all. And I think like today by the different presentations presenters we have seen again, there's still a lot to do to keeping up on uh, reaching all learners. But I agree also uh, what has been said today that there's a lot of opportunities and chances arising currently also like on the technology side and uh, to make sure that um, in the next uh, yeah further on we really make um, our promise becoming true and reaching all learners. So thanks again to everybody. Thanks uh, again to the participants and uh, I'm looking forward uh, to welcome you to um, our next webinar, our fourth webinar on the 29th of June and um, the topic is local inclusive approaches towards education. So we will listen um, to, uh, to colleagues from Jordan and hope to discuss uh, with you also uh, how we can continue uh, learning for, for everybody in this challenging time. Thanks again and uh, I hope to see you next time. Bye.